Our speakers today will be Emil F. Medes, who's Global Regulatory Monitor at Bloomberg, Campbell Pride, President and CEO of XRL US, and our moderator today is Glenn Doggett, the Director of Standards of Practice at the CFA Institute. Um, and I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us, and I want to especially thank the CFA Institute for um, sponsoring our program today and helping us to get the word out to members of the analyst community. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, a couple of uh, uh, logistical points that I wanted to make. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the program today, so please click on the Q&A link if you have a question you'd like answered, and um, we'll be taking them um, probably uh, towards the end of the program, and um, you know, but, but we could just queue them up there. If you have any technical questions or problems, uh, email us at support, S-U-P-P-O-R-T, at xbrl.us, and we'll do our best to get you back up and online. And finally, uh, we, were, we are offering CPE credit for the program today. In order to get the CPE, you will need to answer uh, about four, four different poll questions that'll be done, uh, given at uh, different points during the program. Uh, make sure to click on the links to record your response, and then your CPE uh, certificate will be sent to you within the next uh, week or two. So with that, I wanna thank everyone again, and I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn. Thank you, Michelle. On behalf of CFA Institute, we welcome everybody to this webinar as well. We've been following XBRL for a number of years and thought this was an opportune time to take a look at all of the information that has been filed uh, through the SEC's reporting requirement program and to give some insights as to what can be done. If we take a look at our agenda today, you'll see that we'll, we'll kick off with a, a discussion from Emil and how Bloomberg may be looking at it. Emil Ethramides, has been working for Bloomberg for over 15 years. He is Bloomberg's global regulatory monitor, working with their standardization team, global market reps, and their fundamental analysts. Following the introduction of, from Emil, we'll hear from Campbell Pride. Campbell Pride brings significant experience in technology development, accounting, and finance to XBRL US. Before joining on as the president and CEO position, Mr. Pride led the development and maintenance of taxonomies as chief standards officer playing an integral role on the executive team. Mr. Pride joined XBRL US from Morgan Stanley, where as executive director in the International Services Group, he managed the equity research XBRL-based valuation framework. He has been involved with XBRL since 2001 and served as chairman of the XBRL US Domain Steering Committee during the critical initial build of the US GAAP taxonomy under a contract with the SEC. Prior to joining Morgan Stanley, Mr. Pride was a partner with the risk and advisory practice of KPMG LLP. He is a member of the New Zealand Institute of Chartered Accountants. Following the introductions of the work that's available today, we'll, they'll go to a panel discussion that I will moderate to give everybody a little bit more insight of how XBRL can be used today. We'll close out with a demonstration by Campbell of some practices that you can actually use to access and implement this information into your practice. As time allows, we'll follow up with questions at the end. At this time, I'd like to turn the agenda over to Emil for him to talk about what's going on with Bloomberg. Hi, thank you, Glenn, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, as Glenn mentioned, uh, I uh, work at Bloomberg. And involved uh, in um, Bloomberg's uh, company financial data. And as uh, uh, pertains to XBRL, we're very heavy users of XBRL. We use it uh, everywhere in the world that it is mandated by regulators. And uh, we are looking to, to expand that uh, to any other areas that, that make it available. Currently, uh, countries that we process via XBRL, uh, you see them listed on the slide, uh, Japan, Korea, China, Israel, Brazil, and the US. In a few weeks, we're gonna add one country to that, starting with the 2016 Q1. Uh, Mexico has, in fact, mandated that uh, reporting uh, official financial statements will only be released in XBRL and uh, not in HTML. So we don't have a choice on, on adopting XBRL there, and uh, we are gonna be rolling it out. Uh, as soon as, as that becomes available. That'll be the seventh country that we process. Uh, there are a few other countries out there that, that have XBRL statements. 
Some UK companies issue XBRL. However, it's not mandatory. Uh, we're waiting for a, an EU-wide uh, resolution that would uh, require companies to file XBRL. As soon as that happens, uh, we'll be glad uh, to uh, to process all of those. Um, but uh, so far, this is the universal companies that that we that we uh, cover. Um, basically, um, now we're still on on the first slide. If you you want to back up one, uh, outside of the U.S., uh, we cover only uh, the face of statements on uh, for a um, for companies, um, and usually face of statement is very standardized. If you're familiar with uh, say uh, Chinese statements uh, uh, or uh, some of those other countries, Brazil, for instance, a very standardized format of disclosure, so it translates very easily to XBRL. You can map very easily one to one from uh, XBRL elements to um, our existing uh, data fields uh, for for those countries, um, and so we process the entire market uh, for for those. Uh, Countries that thousands of companies, something like three or four thousand companies, say in in Japan, Korea, China, uh, as many companies as report. Uh, and in the case of Japan and China, we can actually SDP or straight through process all of those reports straight through to our database because, as I said, the their financial reporting is so structured; it's very easy to map. Um, some more recent developments: Japan has added. Uh, tables that are beyond the financial statements, uh, so they are expanding beyond just uh, the face of the statements, and uh, we are going to be picking up that data. Uh, for countries like Brazil or Korea, we can't STP it uh, currently, but it does help us very much in our collection, but uh, that data has to be thrown up in front of an analyst first before it can be uh, finalized and uh, made available to our clients. Uh, from our preliminary look at uh, Mexico XBRL, it looks similar to uh, those other countries that are outside the U.S. In other words, very standardized. It should be relatively easy to map uh, to uh, to uh, our database. Now, if we can move forward to the next slide, let me discuss here uh, what's unique and different about the U.S. First, in the other slide, I was talking about non-U.S. The U.S. case uh, is very uh, different. Uh, in that uh, you, and it stems from the fact that U.S. GAAP is, is so different from uh, other uh, reporting standards because there's so much more freedom in GAAP uh, that translates to that much more freedom uh, in the way that you uh, can present XBRL and it makes it that much more complicated for us to process. Uh, we had look at, looked at U.S. XBRL coverage years back. We're not able uh, to do much with it at the time. However, we have revisited it, uh, and at starting with uh, 2015 Q3, we are now processing US XBRL. Uh, we find that we are able to consume it much better uh, than we thought uh, was the case when we first looked at it, so there have been um, a lot of improvements along the way. We started out in Q3 processing about 1,200 filers. Uh, we have made that, uh, we moved up to 5,000 in Q4 and we expect to process all 6,600 filers uh, in the upcoming uh, 2016 Q1 ending uh, March 31st. Now, in this case, as with a couple of other countries I mentioned, we cannot straight through process data. It, it does require an analyst to sit in front of it and finalize it. Uh, and it also works in conjunction with other pre-processing engines that we have. So it's not the, our only source for intaking um, data, but we do find that it does complement some of our existing uh, engines, by which I mean that it outperforms them in, in some areas. Uh, and uh, cash flow happens to be one area where we do uh, draw a lot of our data from XBRL as opposed to some of our other processes. Um, what are some of the specific challenges uh, of US XBRL? Uh, one of them, of course, is uh, the high use of extensions. And uh, if you're not familiar uh, with XBRL terminology, that refers to um, custom elements that uh, the uh, 
preparer uses rather than using standard elements from the US GAAP XVRL taxonomy. Those, of course, uh, can't be recognized by um, any engine to be mapped uh, to, uh, to our database. And so anytime that companies use extensions, and to the extent that they use many extensions, um, we are going to be losing data and our um, percentage of data that we can actually acquire from any document is only going to drop. So we are very much in favor of uh, some of uh, uh, XBRL US's initiatives on extensions. I think we've, we um, have a data quality committee that we participate in that has been throwing up guidance on extensions. And I believe that we have been making some real progress, which I think that the um, larger public is going to be able to uh, hear about in the form of guidance uh, in coming um, months. Uh, so um, to recap, uh, heavy users outside the US, in the US, we've um, now um, become uh, regular users of XBRL. It's improving every quarter. And uh, we are glad to participate in, in efforts to make XBRL um, consistent and uh, usable. Uh, by uh, a large public. Okay, Glenn, with that, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Emil. At this time, we'll take a look at XBRL US and what they have found in reviewing the filings. Campbell? Um, one of the things we were going to one of the things we do when we're analyzing XPRL data is we basically have a whole mechanism to pull all this data in. And those, and to, to, to derive findings from that, um, we, we've built a, an infrastructure. Um, and since we're a not for profit, we want to make that available to folks um, in a free way. So in 2010, we developed something called the XPRL US database. And, and, and what this database does is any filings that are made with the SEC, as soon as they're made with the SEC, we pull those into the database um, and it extracts the XBRL uh, that's filed with the SEC and puts it into a puts it into a, a database structure. Um, and and that database is updated on a real time basis as those as those filings arrive. Um, then we, we we take that data once it goes into the database, we do some limited normalization on that data, and and basically what that means is we basically take all the dates and we we kind of align them into into periods that you'd probably be used to seeing, like Q1, Q2, Q3, um, Q4, and year end. Um, we also do we align those dates fiscally, and we also allow we also basically work out what the calendar alignment on that data is as well. Um, and, and then we basically take all that data and it sits in a Postgres database and it's sitting on a, what is it, it's called Debian Linux. So that's basically the operating structure we have for it. Um, and that all sits on something called Amazon Cloud. So it's pretty open infrastructure and we'll, we'll talk about it uh, in the next slide, what you can do about it. So you can go to the next slide, please, Michelle. Um, some of the differences with the, a traditional data set uh, or a traditional database, we, we're not doing any normalization of the elements. So we're just taking the data as is and we're not, we're not, and then we're making it available. We're not saying this thing looks like um, interest income. So we're putting that in interest income. There's no normalization being done on it. And, and the reason for that is to make the, the data available I and mean, then people can do their own can do their own sorts or do their own way of you know, allocating um, different line items to, to different categories. So the idea behind this is just to make the, the data available and let people do what they will with it. Um, it also includes um, all data filed. Um, so any number that's included in, in, a, in a filing with the SEC has to, to be tagged in XBRL format. So the data includes all of that. Um, and so all the numbers are included in the filing, but then also is all the text, all the footnotes. So you can do text searching over the database. We have a facility to do that. So if you want to look for certain word combinations, um, you can you can look for that data, which can be which can be incredibly useful if you want to find things like I want to find companies who had a particular derivatives type deal, or I want to find companies who who did some kind of you know like a a reverse merger or whatever it may be, if there's key terms you want to look for, um, you can really narrow down those searches pretty quickly and, and find a, a subset of companies who may have done a particular deal, which may be interested in looking at. 
Um, so what we've done is a couple of things in terms of accessing the data. We've made, we have a public database. We have a couple of copies that we make of the database. We have a public copy, um, which we make available to individual members, uh, which is pretty cheap. And then so you can get that data. Um, you can just query against the data directly. This is really just really to play with and get the you know get an idea of what you can do with it. We also have an access through an API, which I'll show later. Um, so you can just pull the data into like an Excel spreadsheet and, or a Google Sheet. Um, and if you're if you're interested, we make available to folks if you want to take a copy of the database and create your own in-house database, um, we can make that available to you too. So that, that's basically what we we do. That's how we're taking all the data. That's that's how we're using it, and then we we build analytics on top of it. Um, you know, just more as a, a demo type thing. But if people have specific questions. Um, we're also interested in hearing those. So, um, and hopefully you have time today to get, get through a lot of questions. So thank you. Thank you, Campbell. I think now we're gonna turn to Michelle in our first round of CPE questions. That's right. Um, yes, for those of you who are getting CPE credit for today's session, um, you're going to see uh, some questions, some poll questions posted, and uh, you'll just need to respond to each of those questions. So let's go to the first poll question. Okay, the first question we have is XBRL. What does it stand for? Um, extendable business reporting language, extensible business reporting language, or exceptional business reporting language. Um, so please click on the button that you think is most likely to record your vote. And I'll give you um, a few seconds here to, to respond. Okay, whenever we're ready, we can go to the next poll question. Okay, we'll be bringing that up right now. Okay, see the question here, Bloomberg currently does not collect XBRL formatted data from which of the following countries? From Japan, from China, or from Chile? So just click on the link that you think is appropriate and record your vote. So we'll close out this poll in just a minute here, and we'll have uh, two more questions that we'll take at the end of the program. Okay, great, thank you. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Michelle. So I'd like to thank Campbell and Emil for giving us that introduction of how the XBRL data is being used today by the two different organizations and what's available. And I want to drill in a little bit deeper into a few areas. So to say that all investors or analysts want the same access to data would be incorrect. And this is especially true when you look at the diversity of fundamental and quantitative models used to make investment recommendations today. So have you seen a change in what's expected in the available data set as companies have started reporting in XBRL tag data? So Mia, let's start with compliance for possible demands for additional data. Yes, uh, Glenn, uh, yeah, the primary uh, benefit of XBRL uh, would be speed to market. So the fact that um, you can process XBRL and put it in front of people within minutes of the company filing is uh, one thing that uh, makes it, uh, you know, data uh, that you have to have. Um, and that obviously is going to be data that moves the market as a lot of fundamental um, data does uh, when companies report their earnings. So certainly in terms of speed to market, if we didn't have XBRL, uh, we would not be as fast as uh, we currently are. It definitely helps us in that. Um, also in the fact that uh, the volume of companies uh, that we cover makes it very hard to simultaneously update uh, thousands of companies, whereas with XBRL you can at least have some of the company's data up um, quickly. Uh, but to address more directly your question, you were really talking about what additional uh, data sets clients would ask for. And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, yeah, XBRL is also very granular. 
Uh, it adds speed and it also adds a lot of granularity because the requirement is that uh, every um, item that is reported on the financial statement should also be an XBRL. So uh, that can make uh, an entire universe of data available that uh, previously wasn't. Um, typically, uh, in our uh, database, we, we tend to concentrate on the uh, our clients primarily ask about your large uh, bottom line numbers, um, but XBRL actually makes available every uh, single item, say in roll forwards, going from last year's level to this year's level, um, so that it adds a great deal more granularity uh, and uh, detail uh, to uh, uh, company fundamental data. So I would say speed and granularity are the two, um, two characteristics that really make uh, XBRL data uh, really important for. Thank you, Emil. Campbell, looking at these same two questions, they say that XBRL filings, at least here in the US, didn't change the amount of information that was available in a 10Q or 10K. It just made it, uh, it brought it forward in a structured format. You guys have had your database from 2010, and you were involved with data structuring before coming to XBRL US. Have you seen that this granularity shows up in specific sections of the financial reporting that's more useful through the XBRL side? Yeah, th thanks, Glenn. Yeah, one of the one of the the nice things about this is the is having that data uh, on the detailed footnotes, having it a lot more um, available to you much much quicker. So, so one of the things if you wanted to do is one of the things that we've done a lot of work on in the past is looking at pension assets, for example, and looking at the, the breakdown of pension assets held by various funds, uh, by various pension plans. And so you can do that and get an idea across the US market very quickly, you know, where are pension assets being held and, and where are people concentrating them, which is useful information if you're, uh, if you're a pension plan manager, you can use that information to, to see what, what others are doing. Um, or, you know, you can use it if you're trying to reach out to pension plans and sell asset management services to them. So there's, it's, it's having that data available and having be able to basically accumulate it very quickly is, is very useful. And the demo a little bit later will show, show some more examples of how you can do that. Great, thanks. Emil, before we move off of granularity, you mentioned early on that cash flow information was one area that where you've seen an uptick in some of the straight through processing. Are you saying that the footnotes is also beneficial for Bloomberg when you have to turn to your analysts to do some of the information of analyzing the XBRO reports? Sure, absolutely. I mean, for instance, uh, I mean, Campbell just mentioned pensions, uh, any of the other uh, significant information and tables uh, on the system all becomes um, immediately available. So uh, yes, uh, the footnotes very much so. Um, we mentioned pensions. Yeah, you can mention um, a lot of other the stock option information is also on a table that's very easy to extract um, and so on. Uh, yes, so there's a whole range of information there uh, that can uh, alive much faster than it could before. Well, that's that's great. Thanks for sharing a little bit more light into what we're ex experiencing with XBRL that it does allow us to drill in a little bit more. As we move forward to our next slide, I know earlier on, Emil mentioned many of the different countries that Bloomberg is looking at. And I know XBRL US is affiliated with the the global XBRL community through the XBRL International Organization. So Campbell, can you provide a little bit more detail around XBRL initiatives on a global basis and what you know may be in the pipeline going forward? The XBRL is being used in is being used in 60 countries around the world. So we have um, different regulators predominantly have been the main um, adopters of the standard. So if you look in places like the UK, um, you've seen people like the, the tax authorities collecting this data. And the nice thing about that, for example, is that that data is all publicly available. Um, you can go to the UK company's house and you can get private company financial um, data that's that's accessible and that can, that can be um, incredibly useful and um, we've used it 
here, um, which I'll talk about later, we're doing a, an event on blockchain um, technology. Um, and there's a lot of companies who are acting as exchanges. Some of them are based out of the UK. Um, you can go and look at their financial statements, which would normally not really be available to you, but you can get that data. You can search it and pull it up um, in an XBRL format, which, which in itself is incredibly useful. Um, if you're doing if you're doing private equity type work and you want to look at small companies that potentially you, you can buy it gives you all that information to screen over that very very quickly um we did an example we were in the uk and we actually used that data to choose the restaurant we were going to go to um because you could look at that data um and pull it up so quickly and look at who was making good margins um on in, in restaurants and so you can basically look at, you know, determine the popularity of a restaurant when you may not even know what's there. So there's all kinds of crazy uses people can, are using this data for around the world. So it's also being used in um, the UAE and in, in the Middle East. It's being used extensively across Asia and China and Japan, Korea. Um, and it's also being used, obviously, um, so mentioned in Europe and the UK, but also by banking regulators across Europe and the European Union has has a number of pilot projects going um, and full-blown projects going where XBRL data is being used. Great. We have a, a moment here. So, Campbell, I want to stick here on this question a little bit. I, people are joined today through XBRL US to hear about this opportunity. If they wanted to learn more on a global basis, are there XBRL organizations similar to XBRL US in other countries or other jurisdictions? Yes, so the, the, the first place you may want to go to is the xbrl.org um, organization, that's their, their website, and so you can have a look, that'll give you a listing of what all the jurisdictions are around the world, um, and then jurisdictions have their own, um, their own um, information that they make available as well, that relates specifically to things that are happening in that jurisdiction. XBRL International is also working on a... Um, uh, an initiative to classify what all the XBRL data is around the world so that you can just go to one place um, and find out what information you can get from any jurisdiction and, and how you'd go about getting it. Well, thank you. So if we move on to the next slide, this question I have for you, Emil, and you've talked about this some and the ability to straight through process some countries and the inability to do it in others. If you look at what you've had to do and, and also think about the initiatives that Campbell's been talking about. Are there some key similarities or differences that impede or you know allow for success for a, some company like Bloomberg or any other data processor to really use the XBRL filings? Yeah, um, sure. I, I covered some of that when I was talking about uh, you know the um, just peculiarities of US accounting, the fact that you know um, the U.S. XBRL taxonomy reflects uh, the much more liberal U.S. gap, I think, approach to financial reporting, where really you find that no two companies have the same income statement. And that translates to, uh, um, to XBRL in the same way. Everybody's format is a little different. That makes it harder to make it machine readable. Uh, it makes for the fact that the U.S. gap taxonomy is much larger than uh, anywhere else in the world. Um, it's also more ambitious and that most of the world is just trying to put out the, the face of the financial statements, and whereas the U.S. gap taxonomy really reflects everything that uh, you could be reporting in your 10Q or 10K. So, um, yeah, I think the U.S. is a bit of a case in itself. Uh, what Obviously, what makes it the, the uh, easiest for processing is when companies have very similar uh, financial statements. And so it's very easy to map a uh, standard set of elements to intake that into our database. <clears throat> so I, I obviously have to play the hand we're dealt. And uh, with US XBRL, I think we've seen a lot of uh, progress recently. And um, I think that uh, our processing reflects that. So uh, we're hoping to see more of that uh, going forward. Back to you, Vaughn. Thank you, Emil. I, I, clearly, the easier it is to process straight through, the more benefit it's going to bring to anybody who's trying to use the data. I, before we go to the demo, I do have one question that's come in, and I want to relay out to both of you. And the 
the question is the filings that get turned into the SEC and the other regulators, you know, there's a standard instance document as well as calculation and presentation link bases. Which of the documents are you most commonly looking at when you're pulling your information in or are you using a combination of all of the different formats to make sure you understand the data as it's being delivered? Yeah, if I can go first, I think for the U.S. we do need to, to use a combination uh, of uh, the documents. As I said, for the U.S., uh, the data does not go straight through. Uh, it goes up in front of an analyst, and so uh, they are able uh, to see the presentation document as well, which sometimes clarifies a lot uh, where uh, where an item belongs. Um, so yes, ideally you wouldn't really need to refer to that document if you are able to, to SDP it. But uh, with the U.S., we do need to look at a variety of um, different documents. And Campbell, for the, for the XBR U.S. database? Sorry, I'm just trying to get off mute. Um, yeah, so what we do is all the data gets pulled in, and when you when you when you pull across that data, we will take any data that ha has been filed. So um, one of the things we do is, you know, we categorize the data into what's the latest data, so you can always get what the the latest data that's been filed. Um, so you can pull that, but we track all the historical data that has been filed over time as well. So you may have the same value for assets for 2013, may have been reported five times um, so we, we track all that as well so you can you know if you want to see how a number changed over time to see if there's restatements or changes in it you can see that um, but if you just do basic queries then you're we, we're kind of agnostic as to where the data came from um, and depending on how you want to you know extract the data or pull it in, out from a query or pull it into a spreadsheet it's an option that you that you're provided with so you can you can pull that however you want it but there, there's a lot of richness there um, it's drinking from fire, fire hose to some extent um, but once you know how to use it it gives you a lot of different options around how you can use the information well great i think that's a good question to lead us into our demonstration that you have prepared for what's available through the XBRL US website. So Campbell will be pulling that up and giving us a demonstration in just a moment. This will give us an idea of what you're allowed to do and some of the practical applications of the SEC file data that's out there today. So let's pull this over here. So what I'm going to show you today is that there's, we, we've built um, a couple of things I mentioned earlier with the database. You can go to the database directly and you can query it. Um, the other thing you can do is you can pull the data through through an API. So one of the, I'll just show you how, how that works. So I, I just pulled up a, a spreadsheet we pulled together. Um, I'm going to take that long to pull together, just a, you know, a few hours. But one of the one of the things that had um, come up um, for us in the past has been you know looking at the pharmaceutical industry, um, and and one of the things you care about with if you if you're looking at a at a pharma stock, especially if one's doing drug development, you may really care about well, what is their, you know, how many trial, you know, where are they in their stage in doing drug trials, um, stage one, stage two, stage three. I, I know it costs them a certain amount of money to go through each each phase, um, whatever that may be. Maybe it's a hundred million dollars for each phase. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you care about, there's two things you really care about in terms of looking at some of these companies. One is how fast are they burning the cash? How much cash do they have? Um, are they going to have to do another round of financing? How is that going to impact me from a dilution factor with how many, how many um, shares I have? Um, or are they, gonna, are they really spending too much money? They're in stage one. They don't have enough money. It doesn't really look realistic that they're going to be able to raise enough capital. So, so one of the things this spreadsheet does, and I just thought I'd show you this, but I'll show you how to use the API. One of the things we can do is we can pull data in directly from the database. And... Um, the, the way that that the way that that works is that we have um, we've set up a something called a, a um, something on it, something called GitHub, and what what that allows you to do is to basically is to basically be able to pull just be able to pull data, um, and I'll show you where that is um, using a, basically a, a URL in a in a browser. So. 
one of the problems when you're using Zoom is that you have to, have to click on these things. So just to give you, start off with a, with just a simple example of, um, of how, of how this, this works. I'm just going to pull up the link for it here. So this is I'm just copying the, the, the website and I'm just going to bring it up for you. So on, on GitHub, you can see this. If you go to our website, if you go to the Expert US website, you can get to this. We have a we have a link to um, this is the Expert US website coming up now. We have a link to um, using data. You can go to here, um, and you can see here there's something called the Data Analysis Toolkit. Now you have the Data Analysis Toolkit. This gives you um, links to all the information you need to be able to set up an Excel spreadsheet or a Google Sheet if you prefer to use that. Um, and this is what I was showing you here. You can click on here, and this is if this is more if you're a developer type. You can go here and you can you can look at the um, you can look at the API, which allows you to pull pull data directly. So you can these this is some of the calls you can pull. You can pull information from the the XBRL taxonomy. You can pull information from filings. Um, and this one here we were looking at was XBRL values, and this allows you to be able to pull a whole base of values from a filing. And this just basically lists out the parameters you can give it. But we'll we'll work out how that works. Show you how that works in a second. So you can pull data for an element for a given time period. Um, for given parameters. So the, the, first, the first thing we're just going to have a look at here is a, a, an example of um, a pharmaceutical company. And, and so what we're doing in this example is I've just done a dump. These are all the pharmaceutical companies that are listed um, on the left here. And this is data, which, is, um, which I've just pulled from the database. And it's just a parameter here. You can see I've got a bunch of parameters of data I want to pull. Um, First thing is I'm, I'm the first thing on here is an API key. One of the things we do is just so, just so we can you know gauge usage. And you need to go to our website and you can say, hey, give me an API key. And then what we'll do is we'll issue it. Doesn't cost you anything. But when you get that key, in every query you do the database, you're going to provide that key. And it's just it's just a way so that we know how many users and we can we can juggle the the load that we have. So you'll need one of these keys before you want to to pull any data. But once you have one of those, you can pull up. And, and what you can see here is you can provide some elements. I'm providing, give me these elements. This is the, the net cash flow provided from continuing ops. Um, give me the cash flow from operating activities and give me assets current. Give it, for me, give it to me for all these periods. Um, the cash flow statement, I'm pulling basically data out of the cash flow statement. I want to get it for all these periods. I want to get it for 2015. Um, and this is just getting it for all the companies you saw on the left. So if you change one of these parameters, all the, the data will repopulate. I'm just going getting 2014 here, for example, one of the 2014 data. So what it's doing is it's just going and getting it. It's getting it for all those companies, for all those elements, and it's just it's just basically creating a list of it. So there's quite a bit of data to collect here. So it just takes it, it takes a minute. To, to go and pull all that data down. And, and what you can see here, we talked about it earlier, it's got something called Ultimus equals true. But what this is, is basically, you'll see this term used a lot. This is basically give me the latest value for the data, you know, the ultimate and truth kind of is what we, we kind of refer it, refer it as. So what that means, if this is set to true, this is if I've got three values for assets that have been reported to the company, uh, reported by the company, what this is going to do, it's only going to give me the um, the values that um, were the latest values that were reported by the company. So this is this is taking, taking a little bit, of time, a little bit longer than it should. Um, but we'll, while that's thinking about it, we'll just we'll go on. So that what this is going to do is it's going to pull all the data for all these companies. Um, of course, gives me an error. Um, I think with the extra the extra load um, with having every, everyone doing the the demo, it's causing a problem. But um, this is just going to I'm going to pull try and get the 2015 data here. This is pulling quite a lot of data, so it's quite a big query. While that's doing that. Um, I'll just show you a simpler example of, of how this can work. This is, this is something I was just showing you earlier. This is the, the margin comparison. Um, 
so what we've done here is someone had asked us, you know, what are the margins for different um, different companies in the defence in defence contractors initially? So you can see Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, and, and this is using the API in the same way. This one here, this is basically just pulling um, the values for for 2015 for revenues, um, and I'm also getting the the um, net income loss as well. So this query, this it's just like you'd see in many different applications. You basically put in the parameters, which I've just parameterized here. Get me this period. Get me this element for this year for this company. I want the latest value for it. I only want one year. And so basically, you can just do what you'd normally do with a spreadsheet: build up the values. Um, you know, it's giving you some percentages, the net margin on it. One of the nice things with using this because you can get multiple data back in a single query. Um, here's an example of FedEx. Um, and you can use you, you can use this data to get it all back um, sequentially. So what we what we've done here in the API, you can see these values. Um, I'm pulling it back. I'm getting the amount, but you can get multiple parameters back as well. I can get the periods, the years, um, what filing it's for. So it gives me a lot of a lot of information that the API brings me back, and then I can use that to sort the data as well. So. I got FedEx here, but if I was to look at Apple, for example, this will go, it gets Apple, it pulls back, pulls all this data back, um, and then it sorts it for you. So it gets all the periods, all the quarters all worked out automatically for you. I'm asking for nine years of data. I can make it five if I wanted to. This will give me five, five years of data. And this is just an example of a spreadsheet we that, we, that we've built, but what it does is it makes it much easier to, to pull the data relatively quickly. And this is all just done in, this is all just done in Google Docs. Look at this, this thing's not, it's gonna fix this a little bit, just make a quick change to it. It's trying to pull back too much data. We've made it a little bit too big. So I'll just change this to, pull back too much data for too many companies. All right, so that's just going to pull that back. So now we've got this data. You can see what we've done here. Um, this is the case of the cash flows. I've basically gone and said, look, give me all the cash flows for 2015 for all these companies, and it's sorted it. So we've got to add it, and we've got all the values for these different period for these different elements. These are the amounts. This is the entity code. This is the, the CIK in this case, but you know we can bring out the ticker or whatever we want. This is the periods. This this period start. This is an instant of it's a point in time. So that's obviously assets current. You know this. I've also asked to bring back the link for it. This is basically the link back to the SEC, so you can bring all that into your spreadsheet as well. But you'll see this is just a single formula here saying XBRL values multi, um, and it's just saying pull P7 to Q15, which is all the, the data that is here in, the, um, in this API call. Um, and then it's bringing back data from E8 to L8. So as you can see, it's basically bringing back the entity code, the, it reads the, the values at the top. We change these at the top, we'll show you that in a minute, then it'll give you a, a, different, a different value back. So what I'm doing is then I'm just taking all this data and then I just had another sheet, which is basically, I can then use just to pull pull all that information and automatically sort it and put it into an analysis. So this is just telling me how many months how many months of cash or current assets the company has. So what I'm doing is basically I get the first quarter, I get what values I can with this. And so they can work out the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter. This is what their, you know, what their, their cash flow is. You can see this is ABB, um, their cash flow is positive. So, you know, I haven't showed how many months remaining they've got. But you, you may have another company here, which, for example, is you can see here the first quarter, they've got, they're spending five million. The second quarter, they've got a cash, um, operating cash flow of 15 million, positive, positive, negative. So they're, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one here. So you can see, you can go across and you can see how much money they're spending every quarter. 
Um, on average, they're sending six million a quarter. They've got 98 million um, or 115 million in current assets. So they effectively have 49, 49 months of assets that they're burning through. Um, they've still got um, capacity to burn through. Whereas some of these other ones you can see here, this one's only got four months, Apricus Biosciences. So you can see here, like they're spending six, eight, six. They've cut their spending down in the fourth quarter. Um, so on average, they're spending five million a quarter. They've got about six million left at the end of 2015. Uh, so you know, so they've got four months of cash flow. You know, this company is going to either a have to go and raise more capital, or b is going is um, maybe they're in a merger talk to get get acquired by someone else. So these, these companies which have these low these low numbers here are kind of interesting to look at because either they're going to go broke, or they're going to run out of money, or they're going to have to do another capital round. Or they're going to have to do a um, or their in merger talks. So it can kind of give you quite a lot of information to do this analysis before we had done this analysis before having the API. It took it took upwards of a week to do um, to do this stuff. So you can do this stuff very very quickly. You know, just this once the spreadsheet's done, it can be done very fast. So. Um, that's really what I wanted to show you. So you can, if you want to look at this, you can go to the Xperia website. We've got a number of tools here on, on the GitHub site. It shows you, it discusses the API, it tells you how it works, how to use it. Um, and also then we've got a couple of templates up on here as well um, that, you can, that you can use. We have a, a, the margin template, template which, I, which I, I briefly flashed up um, earlier. Um, which was the one with the, which was this one here, which you can use, but it's kind of used just good use as a base. Um, then you can copy this, make a copy of it, go file. This is just in Google Docs. Um, there's some Excel ones there. Um, you can then basically copy the spreadsheet, make a copy of it, and then you can start playing with it and doing things with it. So um, that's the that's the the API. Uh, I just wanted to give you like a flavour for what's possible. All of this data is pulling from the Xperia US database, um, so you can you can use that um, as you will. Um, the other thing, just to note, I've just shown you an example of some elements. There's a lot more data in here, um, so it, it's up to you whatever you want to build and how you want to use it. So Michelle, I uh, sorry, Glenn, I'll hand it back to you. Well, Campbell. Campbell. Before before we move off of that slide we were just on, one of the questions that came in, on your margin spreadsheet, you showed both financial data items as well as financial ratios. The ratios, are they provided through the XBRL filing or is that something calculated based upon the underlying numbers in your spreadsheet? Yeah, so, so I, I think I'm sharing my screen again. If I bring this up again, the, the net margin, this is just a, a calculation of the revenues divided by net income. Um, so it's 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 pretty pretty straightforward, um, and this is just, just simple. One of the things we do though is we're pulling a lot of data. You can see we can pull the graphics in as well. That's not being reported in XBRL, but th this is a, an API which so, uh, another group of folks put up. Um, and then you can, but because you have all the domain names in XBRL data, it actually makes it possible to pull this stuff very 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 easily. And you know this is all adjustable. You know, if you wanted another company, you can just change. We based it all on tickers. The tickers will basically it'll just basically go in, um, pull the ticker, and then it can pull that data in. And you can see public storage has a much better margin than any defence contractor. Um, so it allows you to to look at this stuff pretty quickly. All right. So I would be correct in summarising that the XBRO filings are just the base financial information being reported by the company, any yes. analytical ratio that you would want, you would have to calculate that through whatever template you use. Yes, exactly. And, and we have more complicated ones. Uh, you know, he, here's one for a lease calculation for Apple, for example, um, that we'd been showing. So this is a much more complex, you know, they're not going to tell you what the valuation, well, they may know the change of the lease in the change of the lease accounting. But, you know, we were doing this kind of stuff to show you what the valuation adjustments would be, for example, for a lease calc. So you, you can get as complicated as you want. It could be a simple division or in the case of a, a valuation adjustment for lease, uh, uh, leases. Um, it gets obviously a lot more complicated. Well, well, thank you very much for that demonstration and giving us an insight of how that file data can be used. Uh, Michelle, are we 
turning back to a round of CPE questions at this time or taking more questions from the audience? Uh, yes, we're actually going to go to uh, to two more poll questions. So if we could have those those poll questions brought up. You should see them on your screen now. And again, if you're uh, looking for CPE credit, please make sure that you respond to these. The first question, uh, Uh, Bloomberg expects to complete the processing of XBRL data from all public companies in the U.S. by 2016, by 2017, or they have already completed processing XBRL for all public companies in the U.S. So if you just respond to that question, we'll give you a few uh, seconds here to respond and then move on to the next poll question. Okay, our next poll question. Um, extensions within XBRL datasets are um, one of the following. Custom concepts unique to a particular company that cannot be found in the US GAP taxonomy. They are added data items not available in traditional datasets, or they are extrapolations of data reported by public companies. So if you can just respond to that. Okay, we should be able to close out that poll question. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and um, sorry to bear with me for a second here. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn, who has a few additional questions, and we can, there may be some additional audience questions to ask, Glenn. Yes, we, we have had a few other questions come in, and, and one follow-up, this question is for Campbell. What uh, companies are included in the XBRL U.S. database? Is it just companies supported in the U.S., or is it, uh, everybody filing with the SEC? Yeah, so at the moment, we're just taking any data that's filed um, as part of the interactive data program. So that will include any, um, any U.S. registrants, um, foreign registrants as well. Um, if they're reporting in U.S. GAAP, will be included in the database. Um, if they're a foreign filer reporting in IFRS, they're currently not included um, as those companies are not required yet to report in XBRL. Um, the SEC is working with the, the IFRS, um, the IFRS Foundation, um, standard setters to basically um, have that taxonomy available and so that folks can then start filing, foreign filers who report under IFRS can start reporting in XBRL. And as soon as they do, we will, we will make that data available on the database. Thank you. Mia, the next question that's, that's come in is for you and the how is, and, and for Bloomberg, with other kinds of data that's being used by investors today, are there other item sets that Bloomberg would like to see published in an XBRL format and for company reporting? Yes, as a matter of fact, as many uh, as possible, we'd like to see an XBRL. Um, some of the things that we've we've looked at uh, recently are, of course, uh, there already is uh, XBRL reporting for uh, bank uh, regulator, um, bank regulatory statements to the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So those at FDIC XBRL is something that uh, we will also uh, start processing. Um, and aside from that, looking forward, for instance, uh, we've we've looked at um, and we're 
the possibility of um, having um, the um, municipalities that uh, issue um, muni bonds um, who are required to report in, according to GASB, governmental accounting standards board um, standards, um, that they um, may develop a taxonomy uh, because we currently carry the financials of all um, the reporting uh, municipal issuers. So it would be tremendous for us uh, to get all of that in XBRL as well. Uh, another potential field where uh, we would like to see um, uh, XBRL um, reported uh, that we've looked at a little bit with, with FASB, this is the Financial Accounting Standards Board, is um, uh, tagging and reports the um, client uh, relationships between uh, uh, a particular company, its suppliers and its clients. We have a supply chain product that keeps track of that. Uh, and of course, right now we're having to do all that manually with analysts looking through uh, company reports uh, to, to derive that supply chain. Uh, so with supply chain data regarding uh, company suppliers and company uh, clients would could, would be tagged in XBRL, that would also be a great one for us. Uh, and private company data uh, in XBRL, uh, you know, there's a whole host of things that, uh, that could potentially eventually report in XBRL. And we're really interested in all of them. Well, thank you, Emil. Uh, a question for you, Campbell. It, I know you guys are in frequent contact with regulators at many different levels. Uh, do you know of any projects or future releases that of information sets that will be made in XBRL, either by the SEC or state or uh, other regulator? Yes. Yeah, so um, there's a couple of things going on here. The, the SEC is, you know, the, there's the rules on executive comp. Um, if they go in there, that, that data will be made available in an XBRL format. Um, the SEC had also started looking at the extraction industry reporting again, reporting about, you know, this is things like blood diamonds and all that kind of stuff. And they, they were looking at if that was going to be reported, that would also be reported in XBRL. Um, there has been some requests for comment from the SEC, particularly around stock transfer agents. One of the things we're particularly interested in or would like to see is corporate action data. Um, the SEC has asked for comments on reporting corporate action data in a standardized format, potentially XBRL as well, and we, we have a taxonomy for that. So that, that would be extremely useful for the analyst community. Things like, um, you know, stock ratios, um, getting a lot of this corporate action data, you can have that coming straight into your model as soon as it's reported, uh, would be in incredibly useful. So that, that is something that we, we are actively encouraging the SEC to do. Um, and then around the world, a, a lot of the a lot of effort is going into, and not so much in the US because we don't have it, but in other countries is things like um, company registries. Um, someone had mentioned a question about XBRL South Africa. South African government is looking at basically taking all private company filings and make, getting that available in an XBRL format, um, as are many across Europe. Thank you, Campbell. I, on, you know, from the CFA Institute perspective, I know one thing we haven't mentioned today, and I want to, you know, put it out there if we have regulators listening, is that we, the press releases are also a, a key factor for many in the investment community. Is that's the first time information is released. So if we can have regulators listening and making a stand, if we can get those 8Ks tagged in a reporting format and, and not wait for the 10Qs to come out, I think that would be a great benefit as well. Um, I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up, and, and this is going back to the SEC and, and some of the changes, especially in the international technology. There's a concept called inline XBRL that's being considered um, here in the U.S. and maybe in use in some other places. Is that a big difference in the change between what's being done right now with the SEC filings? Okay, I'm not sure. I go, go, Emil. go ahead, Campbell. No, I'm not sure I, could, I understand the question. Could you just repeat repeat that again, Glenn? I would say there's some some countries internationally are using inline XBRL. And yeah. Rumors that the SEC may be looking at it. Would that significantly change what companies are doing right now and how they file structured data? Yeah. So just just quickly, uh, what inline XBRL is is and is a, is basically 
one of the concerns people had today with filing XPRL is one, they file the data in an XPRL format and they file it in an HTML format. What inline XPRL does is basically you only file the data as HTML, um, but the XPRL is embedded within the HTML document. So that depending how you prepare your filing, for some filers, it's not going to be any, any extra work at all because they're effectively, they, they're effectively doing that anyway. And some of the software providers would, would be able to switch very easily to inline XPRL. And if you're preparing those two documents as separate work streams, um, then they're going to, the, those filers are going to have to make some effort to, to consolidate them. Um, around the world, um, inline XPRL is being adopted by most regulators at this point and the, the project that they had in the UK used inline XPRL and that, that's been very successful because it's, it makes it very easy for people to review their filings and make sure they're, they're okay, you know, they, they match. The underlying, if you change the underlying data, um, the XPRL data changes as well. Um, and, and two, it, they've managed to, you know, roll all that out. Um, it comes straight out of the accounting systems in, a, in an inline XPRL format. So it's been very, very cost effective. Emil, anything to add about X, inline XBRL and in, in, from Bloomberg's perspective? Yeah, I think, yeah, the, I think the benefits of inline XBRL uh, very much are you know, more on the prepare side. I think on our side, uh, we're still dealing with, with the same problems of um, trying to um, intake the data, read it, and map it to, to our database so that uh, um, the fact, yeah, that, that it's integrated in the same statement, I, I don't think that our end makes that much of a difference. But I think uh, there are benefits on the other side for preparers. Yeah, and, and Glenn, on that, the one, the one thing that it would make better from a from a consumer perspective is you could click on a number in theory and then go directly to that number in the financial statements which a lot of data data providers provide today anyway you know that that transparency back to the original number that was filed that that would be significantly easier in an inline experimental format right right we do have that the click through transparency yeah yeah well, Emil Campbell, thank you for your time today. This XBRL filing information is definitely building up in, in a repository out there, and I'm glad you've been able to show us how it's actually being used today. At this point, I will turn the webinar back over to Michelle for any final thoughts. Glenn, thanks so much, and thanks, um, Emil and Campbell, for your thoughts today. Um, we do have a, another a big event coming up from XBRL US in April. This is an in-person uh, FinTech Forum, we're calling it, on smart contracts, blockchain, and data standards. Um, it's, it's a free event. It takes place from one to six and is followed by a cocktail reception. And you will hear speakers at that program from CFA Institute, and it's also um, sponsored by CFA Institute and by Baruch University. Um, you'll also hear speakers from Consensus, ItBit Market, the NASDAQ Stock Market, Safeguard Scientifics, and, and others. Um, and you can see the registration link on your screen. Um, we will be sending out information about this program to everyone tomorrow. Um, and we'll also send out information on how you can access some of the APIs and tools that uh, Campbell mentioned and demonstrated in the, in the program today. And again, those, those tools are free. All you need to do is get an API key and uh, you're ready to go. So thanks very much. And we hope to have you register for the event in New York and uh, to see you on future webinars. Thank you.